Nothing like a family harmony, amen? Thank you for that. She said, Daddy, Eddie, I thought he was Big Ed. I learned Eddie today. There you go. That's what I've always known him as Big Ed. When I came here to Olive Branch, those that don't know, our office has about 1,900 telephone lines coming through and around. And we had so much trouble, Ed would always show up and he just handed me his card and his number on it and said, Preacher, just call me. Don't call Atlanta. You know, I'd call Atlanta and they'd tell me this and tell me that and Ed would come and say, nope, we can't do that. We don't have that here. So I quit calling Atlanta and I just called Ed and he'd take care of it. Thank you guys for, for singing. That's one of my uh, desires is to sing with my two kids. I would love to do that. That's a blessing. I sung with my father and, and listening to you guys sing is just a blessing. Thank you for that. Thank you for the song, too. It's a very special song. This morning, I asked you, I even put it on Facebook, uh, asking you about your bucket list. You know, this is something that came about uh, a few years ago. People started having bucket lists, you know, where they want to go and what they want to do in life, things you want to accomplish, and all kinds of people would put all kinds of things, you know. I've done had three or four of you stop me. You've stopped me this morning coming in. Tell me your bucket list. And where if you could go anywhere in the world, where would it be? And you've told me that. Some have shared with me they want to go to Alaska. Some want to go to Hawaii. Somebody wants to go to Canada and hunt white-tailed deer. You know, they people tell me these different things, and I'm I'm listening to all these bucket lists of, of places. I asked my wife. She thought it was uh, she almost posted on Facebook that this was a trick question. Because as we're sitting there and drinking a glass of tea, I said, Baby, if you had anywhere you wanted to go in the world, where would you go? And she smiled real big and she said, Well, Hawaii or Alaskan cruise and then she threw this one in there that just, you know, just gets you right there in the gut. She said, anywhere where you would be with me. Huh? Hush, Gail. It's enough out of you. Man, anywhere that I'd be with you. And then she thought I was fixing to drop the bomb on her until we was going somewhere. And, I, and, I, and she said, what's that all about? And I said, well, we're going to take a trip tomorrow. I'd love to go to Alaska. I'm dreaming of that one day. It's on my bus bucket list. We'd like to take an Alaskan cruise. Lori and I like to cruise. We enjoy that together. A lot of people don't like to get on a boat because they're contained. I get on a boat because the phone don't work anymore. It's just a great thing. And I don't buy an extra package. I just get on the boat and I'm done for a few days. To I get off that boat and I enjoy that. And we enjoy each other and travel and see different places. We want to go other places and do that. You know, Hawaii is a place that Lori and I'd like to go. We've talked about that in our life. That's two places both of us really want to go, Alaska and Hawaii. We've not been to either place. We've been to St. Thomas. My brother was a missionary there. We got to go as teenagers with our parents to St. Thomas when my brother was there and his wife Miriam and, and, and the first daughter Carol. And, and we've been back there a year ago or so on a cruise and and um, you, you remember that story mama and Lori's mama were both there with us on our trip as teenagers and we were sitting out uh, uh, right below the dormitory where my brother taught at the college and it was overlooking the bay where the airplanes would land actually in the ocean the runway was in the ocean because it was it had to be so short they'd stop at St. Martin and, and take fuel off the plane and luggage so they could land the airplane at St. Thomas back Back then that's been a long time ago and we're sitting there and that moment's about to happen brother David where I kind of lay my hand on her hand and I'm fixing to lean in her for a kiss you know I'm, I'm about ready to make the move and lean in for the kiss and about that time up above us at the window is, is Luana and Wanda 
pointing their finger at us. I couldn't get a kiss in. They were telling us not to. So we couldn't wait to get to St. Thomas and get up on the mountain and have somebody take our picture while we were kissing each other and send it back to our moms to tell, to tell them. You know, we've all got desires of our heart, don't we? You know, and I think I could go around the room and somebody posted they wanted to go to Sweden. Somebody posted they wanted to go to Europe. Somebody posted they wanted to go to South America, the different places to view and to see. And all across the world, I have a desire maybe one day to go to Australia. My family has had a dear friend. His name is Dr. Michael Marsh. He's a missionary, and he's been a missionary for 45 years to Australia. My family has supported his ministry and Lori's family, both... Uh, uh, our, our family supported uh, Brother Marsh, and he's been in our homes, both our homes, before we got together. And I'd love to go. He's still there and got family, and he's working. He's really getting of age, and he's still there on the field, and he's working in Australia. And I've often uh, thought about how beautiful that would be to go to Australia and see that country. But there's something nobody has said. I'd like to go to the Holy Land. Uh, you know, somebody came back recently. Miss Mildred just been over to the Holy Land and she brought me a bookmark and on that bookmark is some pictures of, of special places and, and I've already started naming some places and she'd walk by me in the service and say, Brother Gary, we were at that place just two weeks ago and I'd like to see that in my mind as I read the Word of God and, and, and realize, oh, we were there. You know, I'd like to do that one day to go to the Holy Land. And, and, but there's something nobody's said yet. Nobody has mentioned that they'd like to go to hell. Nobody. Nobody's mentioned that because there's somewhere that if we could go to hell, I believe it would change our life forever. Literally. I believe if we could take a tour of hell and go down through hell and just make a visit. I, I was studying on Monday and I got to Googling. I Google a lot now. I get on there. You can find out a lot. Some of it's not real. Some of it is. You got to kind of pay attention and look at it, study it closely. There was something I was looking for because I was studying in my Bible about people that's went to hell. And there's several people in the Bible that's went to hell. And by the way, I know I'll bust a lot of your bubbles, but good people go to hell. Only saved and redeemed people go to heaven. And, you know, I, I say that all the time to you, and I, I talk about that, how that I've done funerals for 30 years, and how that only two people were mentioned in my 30 years of doing funerals that maybe Papa or maybe Mama or Mom or Dad maybe went to hell. Everybody else says, well, I know they didn't go to church for 45 years, and I know they didn't really serve the Lord, but they were a really good person, and so you don't know that. I know you didn't know that, but they were a really good person. But the Bible says only the redeemed of the Lord go to heaven. And it's something for us to all to really remember and think about in our lives because a lot of people go to hell and it's something we don't talk about and it's something that doesn't go on our bucket list. But I'll tell you what, it would change our lives forever. And I was sitting thinking about what sounds are in hell. What sounds? What do you hear in hell? You know, what do you hear? What do you hear in hell? When you get to hell, what's there? And, and, and what do you hear? And I, I Googled, and I'm not a very good horror picture guy. I don't like horror pictures. Now, you may like horror pictures. I believe in the devil. I believe he's real. I believe he's real in my life. And I believe demons of hell come to combat me in my life. I believe it's an ugly thing. And I don't like horror pictures because I believe that some of these things that, that we see and deal with, especially some of these guys that kill and murder people and cut their bodies up and eat them and, and all these kind of things, and you're thinking like, oh, gross. Well, guys, that's real life. And I don't believe a normal person can do those things. I believe there has to be something wrong with them. And I believe it has to deal with Satan and demon possession and demons from hell in a real place. So I got to go. I said, uh, sounds from hell. I googled it. Sounds from hell. An article came up from Siberia over in Russia and in, in European countries about some, some guys that were drilling 
on this outpost just way out of close to nowhere. You, you can Google it yourself and you'll see the newspaper articles that's there. Whether it's true or not, I don't know, but I read it and I almost played it, but there was a lot of young people here and when I really got to listening to it and watching it, I thought, I just don't want that to be a great fear factor because it kind of bothered me as I was reading the articles and listening to it. How they drilled down to one of the farthest points that had ever been drilled before and when they got to a certain point their drill their bit was real like drilling in something hollow like they had gotten to a cavern but it was it was very very deep that they'd gotten to and and it says that they pulled out and they could hear something they could, they had devices that they could hear as they're drilling they listened to their their drill as it drills and one of the guys said here I want somebody to listen to this and he handed it over to somebody else and what they could hear was screaming. And they heard people's voices screaming. The article goes on to say that the men quit drilling. Half the team actually never drilled another hole ever again because of the things that they encountered and because of what they heard on their radios that day as they were drilling down into the earth's surface and got to this deep point that they felt they were at the earth's center. And they heard people crying. Somebody said, well, where's hell at, preacher? Well, I know it's down because everywhere in the Bible that I read about hell and I preached a message about two years ago talking about hell and studying about hell and we know that hell is down. We don't know exactly where it's at. And you may be here today and you may say, well, I don't really believe in hell. Well, you're talking to a man that believes the Bible and I believe in a place called hell because the Bible says there is. And I believe in a literal place called hell. Not, not just a fictitious place or, or a dimension that you go to. I believe in a real, literal, fire-burning, tormenting hell that people that reject Jesus Christ go and spend eternity. That's what the Bible teaches, and I believe that. And this morning, I want to take you on a journey through the halls of hell. Not Alaska, not Europe, not Sweden, but the journey through the halls of hell. And I want you to go with me, and I want you to hear as we walk through there. And I don't want us to go by ourselves. I think that would be terrible. They won't let you go to Mammoth Cave by yourself. Amen. You got to have a lot when you go to Mammoth Cave. A guide. You know, you get on whitewater rapids. You can't go by yourself. You got to have a lot. A God. I've been on some whitewater rapids before, you know, and everybody's tough and brave. I'm not tough and brave. I don't want to drown. Amen. You know, we get on those whitewater rapids. We go down in Mammoth Cave. We got to have a guide to make sure we get out. Amen. I want to make sure I come out and eat lunch. Amen. I don't want to get down there. And now I may not find the restaurant that's way down deep inside. I may not find the river that's down there if I don't have a guide. So I want to invite someone to go with us today. And I've invited Gabriel, the angel, to escort us down into the halls of hell today. I want Gabriel to go and guide us. I know he's one of God's top three angels. It's mentioned throughout the Bible. So I'm asking Gabriel to take us and go. And as we enter into hell, I, I want you to understand that we're going to hear groans and cries of the helpless souls who pass God by in this world. Some of them saw Jesus. Some of them knew about God and they still said no. The Bible teaches us that they're in a place called hell. And as we go there right now, uh, just, just be cautious. Uh, stay together. Don't get ahead of me. I know some of you want to hurry up and run through the halls, but stay with me because I want you to hear what's going on down as we walk through hell. I want you to understand that not one of the people in hell had to come there where we're, we're going. They didn't have to go there. They chose to go there because they rejected Jesus Christ. See, a Savior named Jesus died upon a cross to save mankind from his sin and to keep man from going to a place called hell. Jesus died that you would trust and believe in him. But people have rejected the belief in Jesus. They've rejected faith in Christ. There's no hope for them now because once you're in hell, you don't get a second chance. You don't get a buy to get out. Once you die and go to hell, you're there for eternity, the Bible says. You're there. So some had mighty and high positions in this world. And some were rich and proud. 
But in hell, they have no power, no authority, or no hope. I want you to turn with me first to Genesis chapter 4 in your Bibles. Genesis chapter 4, and I want to see the first character as we're walking down the halls. Everybody kind of hold hands with each other. Be careful. It's dark down here. And all of a sudden, you may hear about somebody hollering, Listen, listen. Am I my brother's keeper? Listen. He's screaming and he's hollering. Am I my brother's keeper? And around the corner we go and we walk up on a man that's just screaming in torment and pain. And he's saying, am I my brother's keeper? He was one that was taught and he was taught the right way, but he didn't listen. As we go down the hills of hall, we hear a man screaming, am I my brother's keeper? And as we ask the angel, who is this man, Gabriel? Who is this man? There's a story in the Bible about two brothers. One was named Cain and the other was Abel. And Cain did what to his brother Abel? He killed him. Why? Why did Brother Justin ask these young people about this morning? What was that word? Jealousy. You know why he killed him? Because of jealousy is why he killed him. They both were taught by the same parents. They were taught how to worship. They were taught how to conduct themselves. And if you'll look right here in the Bible, and if you'll look in Genesis chapter 4, and you'll pay attention, you'll see in verse 1, And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. She again bare his brother Abel, and Abel was a keeper of the sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in process of time it came to pass that Cain brought of the fruit of the ground an offering unto the Lord. Abel he brought of the firstlings of the flock and of the fat thereof, and the Lord had respect unto Abel to his offering. See, God taught that the, the sin of mankind was to be covered by the blood of an animal. And so we see the brother Cain bringing in vegetables and fruit from the ground, which is a picture of works salvation. Works, why is that? Because that's what he grew. That's what he did. He put the seed in the ground and he brought it in and God already in the Garden of Eden took an animal and killed it to cover up the sin of Adam and Eve. And they already knew God's process that God had chosen. And so one brother brings in the vegetables from the ground and the other brother brings in the blood offering. And the Bible says God had respect for him. See, there's something about doing it God's way to receive God's blessing. And you and I are guilty of doing things our way and we think it's okay and we think we can get by with it. But I want to show you today, you've got to do it God's way, not your way. All throughout the Bible. We think we can choose to worship. We think we can choose to believe whatever we want to believe. We say, well, this doesn't convict me. I know it convicts somebody else. Listen to me. We need to be following the Word of God. Cain and Abel was taught by mom and dad that knew how to do it the right way. They'd already been punished. And yet, one brother chose to do it his way. Well, I'll just do it my way. It shouldn't matter. And so he brings in that offering. Wow. These guys were brought to bring their offerings to the Lord. And, and so here they both come and Abel killed a lamb and gave it upon the altar and smoke ascended and God accepted his blood offering. But Cain was wicked and proud and he brought the first fruit that he'd raised and offered it and God turned the offering down and Cain became angry and jealous. The Bible says he went out into the field and found his brother, slew him and buried him. God then came down and spoke to Cain. Where is thy brother Abel? Cain, where's your brother Abel? And what did he say? Am I my brother's keeper? Am I my brother's keeper? He knew where his brother was at. He killed him and buried him. And he was lying to God. Am I my brother's keeper? I'm not my brother's keeper. So those words would haunt him the rest of his life. In hell. Burning in the pits of hell. He's screaming out, Am I my brother's keeper? 
God said, I know what you've done. Your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. The Bible tells us that God pronounced a curse upon Cain. Why is Cain in hell? It's because, is it because he's a murderer preacher? No. There's been many murderers that actually went to heaven. Why? They confessed their sin and repented of their wrongdoing. One of them's David. David confessed his sin. He killed. He committed adultery. It was premeditated. But he was God's man. He repented. Oh, he's not in hell because he murdered somebody. Cain is there because he would not come through God's way of salvation. The blood. He wanted to do it his own way. Because he chose to do it his own way, he was now in hell. And if we visit the halls of hell today, we see Cain saying, Am I my brother's keeper? It's haunting him. All throughout the Bible, salvation had to come through sacrifice and blood. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 22, the Bible said, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without shedding of blood is no remission. Wow. As a supreme sacrifice, the Son of God poured out His rich, red, royal blood for the salvation of all men. The way to escape tales to come through the blood-stained way of Jesus Christ and the cross of Calvary. Cain was too proud to take the way. He gave crops, works, His way. Today, men and women are trying to find salvation in the wrong way. And I'll be honest with you, there's many pulpits today that are refusing to preach the gospel of blood. They, they talk about other things and the love of Jesus, but they won't talk about the blood. Listen to me this morning. I'm telling you salvation is through the blood of the Lamb, Jesus Christ. And there's no other way. You can choose to do it your way and you may be like Cain and find yourself in hell one day. You may live life here upon this earth, but you'll find out one day that it's real. Cain went to hell because he rejected God's ways. There ought, preacher, I, I think there ought to be more ways than one way to be saved. If I live a good life, but listen, God set the plan up. We follow God's word. There is no other way. You know, that's what's hard to believe. What's two plus two? Somebody tell me. Why ain't it five? Teacher, why ain't it five? Why is two plus two four? Why is, what's three plus three? Why? Why ain't it seven? Well, preacher, that's the standard. That's just what it is. Why are you accepting that for? What's the deal? We accept some standards. Somebody came up with what a quart equals in ounces and what a teaspoon and tablespoon is. Somebody made standards. Somebody designed them. They're written in a book and given to us. 100 cents in a dollar. Why is there 100 pennies in a dollar? Why is four quarters equal a dollar? Think about it. There's so many things we just accept. Well, that's the way it is. Isn't that what we answer? That's the way it is. But we won't go by God's standard in the Word of God. We'll go with the world's standard, but not God's standard. Don't you think there's something wrong with that picture? There is. We'll go with man, but against God. When God says to do something one way, we'll follow God. The Bible tells us we won't argue the standard of 2 plus 2 equals 4 and 3 plus 3 equals 6. We won't argue that. And there's 36 inches in a, a yard, three feet in a yard. We, we won't argue that. That's the way it is. That's the way we were taught. We should never argue the standards that God has set up in the Word. He has one way to salvation, and that's through Jesus Christ. We're to come by repentance and faith to the blood-stained cross of Calvary and accept Christ as Savior. That's the only way. Cain could have repented and he could have gone to heaven. He could have looked at God and said, God, I'm wrong and you're right. But he didn't. He chose his way. Let, let's, let's go a little bit further. Turn your Bibles to Genesis chapter 6. 
Let's go a little bit further. We're going to walk down the halls. Listen, Carolyn, you're closer. Listen, they're, they're around the corner there. Roger, we're going to let you go before Carolyn. Go around the corner. Listen. Let us in! Let us in! And they're screaming. There's a bunch of them too. It's not just two. Listen, Carolyn, they're around the corner. And they're screaming, let us in. In Genesis chapter 6, the story is about a man named Noah. And Noah built the big ark. I tried to call it a boat or ship one time in front of the kids and they kept correcting me. It's not a boat or ship, it's an ark, preacher. He built this great ark and he told everybody it's going to rain. And he told the people in the city it's going to rain. And he built the ark for how long? hundred years. And he preached and he preached. But I'd quit at year two. I've said that over and over again. He didn't have one person turn and follow. He kept building the ark and I don't know, maybe he built the ark in the daytime and did revivals at night. I'm not sure. But he'd go into town to buy supplies and he'd tell them, it's going to rain. It's going to flood. And they'd look at him and say, you're an idiot. You're crazy. What's rain? What's flood? And one day he got this massive big ark built and he climbed on it with his family and he called out. God gave him power and ability to speak and to animals two by two came, male and female. And that, there's a miracle of God right there. Because we wouldn't get male and female, would we? We'd get four males and three females and you know what I'm saying? We'd get it all messed up or all males would come aboard, you know, and not females. It was God and God, God let it happen and here come all the animals. They got on the ark and they had food on the ark. God did it all. And God let it start raining and the dude up in town went, what's that? He's like me, didn't have a lot of hair. So it kept falling and all of a sudden it's wet. And it's running down his face. What is it? And it kept coming and it kept coming and he ran out and he saw as his house disappeared in water and he ran out to the big ark that the crazy guy was building. And he started beating on the side of the wall. Let us in! Let us in! As the waters began to rise and his house disappeared and the town disappeared. And I'm sure they were on the biggest peak over here on the hillside or climbing some big tree that they could get up in, waving at Noah to do what? What would you be doing? I know what I'd be doing. You know what I'd be in? Same thing I believe they were doing. Let us in! Let us in! You know what Noah said? It's too late. I can't even open the door. God shut it. I can't open the door. Let us climb up the side. Listen, go back there, turn your rudder. Maybe that's what it's called. We're not sure. Whatever it is to turn this thing. Bring it over there at that hillside and pick us up. I can't. I can't. And I believe those people are in hell right now around the corner screaming, Let us in! Let us in! Oh, how we'd wish we'd believe that crazy man! As they died, and God destroyed the world with water. And those people are screaming in hell today, Let us in! What's God's promise to us today because of that flood? Some of you posted it this week rainbow that I'll never do it that way again so down in the halls of hell we've pa come past Cain and now we're walking past all those people that are screaming let us in let us in oh I'm sorry oh no I will believe anything and everything you say just let us in and for eternity they scream let us in but it's too late you know, the people of Noah's day could have repented. Noah preached to them. Noah lived Jesus in front of them. And they rejected the belief in the flood. And they rejected the need of the ark. And they rejected in Noah. And they died and went to hell. There's another one I want you to look at if you'll turn to 1 Kings chapter 21 in your Bible. 1 Kings chapter 21. And I know the time's not going to get me, so I'm going to keep going. Here in 1 Kings chapter 21, we find a woman and she's weeping. We come around the corner over there, Jim Totten, by you and Peggy, and we're coming around another corner. And this woman is weeping and she's painting her face. 
And she keeps painting her face and the angel tells us that it's Jezebel. We remember Jezebel from 1 Kings 21. She's one of the most wicked women who ever lived. She was queen of Israel and her husband was Ahab. Ahab was a wicked king and a big king and he wanted a certain vineyard. I'm not sure if the wine that day won the contest, became the best vineyard, or if it was bigger vineyard than the one he had, but he wanted that vineyard. King Ahab did. Naboth is the character, he's the man that, that, that had the vineyard. And Ahab wanted that vineyard and he went over to Naboth and said, I want to buy your vineyard. I want it. I'll give you another one. And Nabal said, I can't. It's been given to me down through generations. This, this vineyard's been given to me. It's a, it's a blessing from God. And, and, and i got to keep this vineyard. And, and Ahab was angry and mad. And he went home. And man, she had had the chef that day fix a big dinner. And he wouldn't even eat bread. The Bible says he went and lay down, turned his back against him, and wouldn't even lift and eat bread. That's what the Bible says if you have time to read that. And she come in there and said, why won't you even eat bread? It had to be Jetta Harris's bread, amen? Anybody had Jetta Harris's bread knows what I'm talking about. Or maybe Nicole's new yeast roll she's making a mama's, I'm not sure. But it had to be some kind of homemade bread, man, because it just melts in your mouth. And he wouldn't even touch it. He went to bed without bread and he turned his back. And she came in, Jezebel came in and said, baby, 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 what's wrong with you? You wouldn't even eat your bread. Oh, honey, I want this vineyard over here. It's the best vineyard in the land, and that dude named Naboth got it, and it's been passed down from generations. He said, I can't have it. And you know what Jezebel says? I'll get your vineyard. So she did. She went, and she said, I'll take care of, uh, of this God man. I'll take care of him. Long story short... She got the vineyard. She had Naboth killed. Wow. And she thought she was getting by with it, see. She went on with a long time, just kind of like Nebuchadnezzar went that year after Daniel said, you're going to lose your kingdom. We're studying on Wednesday night. Uh, she, she went a long time and her sin just didn't seem to, to come forward. So he sent a message to Elijah, go and tell that woman that one of these days the dogs are going to lick her blood and eat her flesh. You said, ooh, preacher. That's right. Read it in 1 Kings. The dogs are going to eat your, lick your blood and eat your flesh, Jezebel, because of what you've done. You're evil. Nothing happened. I'm sure she swelled up with pride. But let me remind you that you can never get away with sin when it comes to God. You'll never get away with sin. The Bible says that one day, Jehu came riding towards the palace and Jezebel wanted to gain favor with him. She painted her face and she looked out the window as he approached. Jehu cried out, Who is for us? And the two eunuchs appeared at the window. Jehu said to them, Throw her down! They threw her down. You know, you know why she painted her face and stuck herself in front of the mirror? It was a sexual thing. I want to give myself to Jehu. Here he comes down the road. I'll paint myself up pretty and I'll look out. And he said, throw her down. They threw her down, the Bible says. Listen, throw her down. They threw Jezebel down upon the pavement. Jehu drove his horses and his chariot over her body. Later he said to his servant, she's a king's daughter, go and bury her. At least we'll give respect and do this. But when they look, went to look for her body, they couldn't find but just a few bones remaining. Why? Don't you remember what was supposed to be told to her? 2 Kings 9.35, the dogs had licked her blood and eaten her flesh as God had said they would. You cannot fight God and get away with it. You cannot say my sin will never catch up with me because it will. Jezebel was killed. Her body was eaten by dogs. The preacher, this is a nasty message. You didn't realize sin was that nasty? You didn't think hell was a terrible, nasty place? 
We don't want to talk about hell. We don't want to talk about nasty stuff. We don't want to talk about bad stuff. We want to live our lives like we want to live them. And then say, I was good. I'm going to heaven. That's not what God says. Hell is a dreadful place for anybody to spend eternity. This lady Jezebel, she could have confessed her sin. The woman at the well. Y'all remember the woman at the well in the New Testament? Jesus made sure he was at the well. The disciples wanted him to go to town and bypass the well. They went on into town to buy meat. And Jesus went by himself. And the woman at the well was a woman that had multiple husbands. And Jesus was there and she came and she, he, he was getting water and she was getting water. And he told her what mattered the most. You can have water that will last forever. And the woman at the well repented of her sin and repented of the multiple husbands. And she was saved that day. See, repentance does it. Repenting of our sin. The Bible goes on and we continue down in Mark chapter 6 verses 14 through 29. I hope you're writing these scriptures down. A man and a woman were running from something. As we walk down the halls of hell, we got to be careful. Move over! Here he comes. They come running by. They're running from something. This man and woman and they're screaming out and the, the angel tells us it's Herod. The Bible says it's Herodias. His wife and Herod went to Rome. The Bible tells us in the story in 14 through 29 of Mark 6, Herod went to Rome. He took his brother's wife. He brought her back to Jerusalem. He lived with her. And one day, a preacher showed up in town. He's kind of ugly, kind of bushy, rough around the edges. Didn't do things the kind of way everybody else did. And the preacher, John, he began to tell, you can't take another man's wife and get by with it. That's wrong. Herodias got angry and she forced Herod to put John the Baptist in prison. John the Baptist was put in prison. And one day, the king had a birthday. You all know what he asked for for his birthday? It wasn't Texas Roadhouse. It wasn't Red Lobster, and it wasn't a new shotgun or a pistol or decoys. When, that's what all y'all get too, isn't it? It wasn't none of those things. What was it, preacher? They, they threw a party for him, and, and, and they, they had the lady's daughter come in and dance. And Herodias said, I'll get even with that preacher, John the Baptist. Her daughter came in and began to dance in front of the king. By the way, she probably didn't have much on if y'all need a visual. Y'all thought she was fully dressed? She wasn't. And she was dancing in front of the king and the king was drinking. Drinking don't hurt nobody. The king was drinking, having a big time, and kind of got a little bit out of his mind because that's what happens. And then he looked upon that young girl. Woo, got to flirting with her. Come over here and dance. She come over there and danced. And he kind of let her know he kind of liked to have her. Oh, I'll do anything for you, but I need something. <laughs> yeah, something. I'll do anything for you, sweetheart. You know that man named John in the prison? I want his head on a platter. You know what the king gave her? See, sin will lead you in a lot of dark places. Do you know what the king gave her? John the Baptist's head on a platter. I'm sorry that's so gory. It's truth. Here comes John the Baptist's head on a platter. God's man. Now, Herod and Herodias is running through the halls of hell, wondering, thinking about John the Baptist coming back because, see, the story goes on that I can't even read, and it talks about this other man that came into town that was doing signs and wonders, and the king thought John the Baptist has come back from life, from death to life. But the man was Jesus, not John the Baptist. 
But the king thought it was John and he was back. And the king was scared to death that this one that we cut his head off and killed him was back from the dead and he was haunting them. But it wasn't. It was Jesus and it's called a guilty conscience. And so now through the hells, through the halls of hell runs Herod and Herodias as they're running. Can you imagine? Let's move just a little bit further. Jonathan and Emily, back there by you. Y'all going to lead the way this time. Going around the corner. We go around the corner and we see a man washing his hands. He's washing his hands and he's uh, in agony. And there's a woman by his side. If you look in there, look in there, Jonathan. There's a woman by his side. And she keeps saying, I told you not to do it. I told you not to do it. And he keeps washing his hands. The angel tells us, Gabriel, Gabriel, who is it? He said, it's Pilate and his wife in Matthew 27, 11 through 26. It's Pilate and his wife. One day Jesus stood before Pilate, the governor, at that time. And he knew that Jesus was a different man. He knew this man was different. He knew he was a good man. He knew he did miracles. He knew he was honest. There was something special about Jesus. He knew that he was a good man and couldn't find any fault in him. Pilate was a politician and he wanted to gain favor of the crowd so he turned Christ over to be crucified in Pilate's time. And he could have turned and he didn't have to give Jesus but he gave the crowd what they wanted. He did the political thing. He agreed with the crowd. You know what? We're guilty of agreeing with the crowd today and keeping our mouth shut sometimes about things in the Bible that we ought to be speaking out and standing for God. There's some that wants to be popular. They go off into worldliness and sin and God is left out. Pilate was warned. Pilate knew what was ahead. He was not the only one. You've been confronted with a choice. Your conscience has told you to leave your sin and follow Jesus. You've been in a church service and you've been convicted that you need to say yes to Jesus and no to the world. Warned time after time after time, you've been warned to turn from your sin. You could come to Jesus and say, you're sorry. I have to come to Jesus and say, I'm sorry. And then there's a last one. I know what time. We go down the hall and we hear a man crying. I have betrayed innocent blood. Trying to get out. We're trying to hurry through the halls of hell. And he screams, I have betrayed innocent blood. Matthew chapter 26, verse 14, and then over to Matthew 27, 4. There was a man that Christ selected to be in his inner circle, and his name was Judas. He served as treasurer of the group, but he wound up in hell being even a follower of Christ. He ended up in hell. The treasure of the disciples is in hell today. What is it, preacher? It's not what's on the outside, church. It's what's on the inside. The Bible says you must be born again. By the way that some people live, act, talk, you know that they have not had an experience with Jesus Christ. But, but I know I got saved at Bible school. I even got baptized. Do you have an experience with Jesus Christ? Are you fellowshipping with the Lord? Are you praying and reading the Word of God? And is He talking to you? There has to be an interchange. The Bible says you must repent and be born again. And repentance is turning away from, not getting more involved in. God help us today as we tour hell. And we see all these things and all these people. Judas loved money more than he loved himself and he sold his soul for money. And then when it happened, he took the money back and he threw it down and he tried to get it, give it back, but it was too late. If he would have repented, but he didn't, he went out and he hung himself in a tree. Wow. Well, it could go on. Because then there's the text I gave you about the rich man. You remember it? 
If you turn there to Luke with me and let me read that text to you and I'll close. Luke 16, 19. There was a certain rich man which clothed in purple and fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. That means he may have got to go to Red Lobster, Texas Roadhouse, or nicest places to eat. He fared sumptuously every day. Wore nice clothes. There was a certain beggar named Lazarus who laid at this gate full of sores. Desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, moreover the dogs came and licked his sores. It came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. The Bible tells us there was a place before Jesus died, and that place was called Abraham's bosom. And people went there till Jesus died upon the cross. So here's Lazarus on one side, but there's a gulf fixed between the two, and there's the rich man right on the other side. Look in verse 23. And in hell, this is, this is the rich man. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell, he lift up his eyes, being in torments. By the way, my Bible says red letters. Who's speaking? Jesus. This is Jesus speaking what I'm telling you. And in hell he lift up his eyes being in torments and he seeth Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. I'm tormented in this flame. I didn't make it up that hell is hot and hell has flames and it's torment. Jesus said it does. And he wanted one drip of water to cool. Abraham said, Son, remember thou in thy lifetime you had good things. Likewise, Lazarus, he had struggles and evil things. Now he's comforted and you're tormented. Lazarus believed. You didn't. Beside all this, between us and you, there's a great gulf fixed so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot, neither can they pass to us, that they would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou wouldest send him to my father's house. I've got five brethren. And he may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. Abraham saith unto them, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear. When you get to hell, you can't send anybody back to your family and tell them that hell's real. It's too late. But it's not too late today. He said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. He said unto him, If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither way they be persuaded, though one rose from the dead. This morning you're here and I'm going to tell you that there's not going to be a person come through the walls or through the wall back here or fall through the ceiling and they're not going to come in a ghostly form and scream in your face and say that there's a hell. But I have painted a picture for you today and I've showed you in the Word of God where multiple people are spending eternity in a devil's hell because they rejected God's way. Today, it's your choice. Will you reject God's way? You may be like Judas. You're in the inner circle. You're treasure. You're right there up close and front and see everything that's going on. But just because you are doesn't mean you're going to heaven. Just because you're a member of this church doesn't mean you're going to heaven. The only way you get to heaven is by putting your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Friends, I'm trying to be as honest and blunt as I can today. Hell is real. The Bible says so, and I believe the Bible to be God's Word. And if you reject Jesus Christ, that's where you'll spend eternity. Would you accept Christ today? As Jonathan comes and our musicians, and we offer an invitation, will you say yes to Christ today? Will you? We're going to sing. An opportunity for you to come. Now, I know it's tough. Some of you wonder why I walked down this aisle. I walked in this aisle to get your attention. Because I know there's lots of distractions going on all through the service and things and people moving. I walked in this aisle to try to gain your attention back to me because you're trying to be... Do you know why your attention span is wandering off on other things? Because the Holy Spirit of God from God the Father in heaven is trying to speak to you in this room today. Do you know what Satan wants? He don't want you to hear anything I got to say. <clears throat> He wants you to reject what I'm talking about and just keep on living a life like you're living today. The key is if you're saved or not. And the key is, is are you really living for Jesus? Because one day, death will come to us.
what will they say? You were a good person? Or will they say you were a God person? Say, I'm looking around the room. What will they say about you? Will they say that you knew Christ or I'm not totally for sure and just kind of sweep around it best they can because they don't want to offend somebody the day of the funeral? So you mean that happens? You got that right, it happens. It happens right here to this man. I don't want to look at the family and say, I think they went to hell. What about you? What about your family? What about your kids? What about your neighbors? First of all, what about you? Where will you spend eternity? You say, preacher, I'm not sure, but I want to I wanna make it sure, and I want to go to heaven. I'm going to be standing here in the altar, and if you need to come and trust Christ today, would you come to me? I'll talk to you. I'll put somebody with you, and we'll show you how to accept Christ today. If you need to come and just get things right and you've just been coded and indifferent and you've not been following the Lord as you should, listen, the preacher's got to get on his knees and just get right with God many times. You need to do that today. Maybe you need to come and unite with our church. Whatever it is God's leading you to do, this is your invitation. Jonathan, as we stand and sing, what number? Number 321. 321, as you stand and sing, would you come?